uh, uh, we're going to be doing sampling, we're going to be working with studies and so on and so forth. And we want to under understand how chance or probabilities impact what happens when we take a random sample, for instance. So we need to have a little bit of a background with probability. Now, I got at least a couple of people who got a little nervous because section uh, one, uh, uh, assignment 1B, the second part of the assignment, um, had a, uh, a little bit of a question where they asked you, what's the probability of something? That was a really, I didn't really intend that as a probability uh, question. Uh, uh, I really intended this kind of an interpretation question for histograms. Okay, so you look at the histogram, that's from the homework, right, for instance. And uh, if we count these up, anybody remember how many total uh, lottery winners were here? 30, okay, great, thank you. So if I asked you how many of the lottery, uh, what, what's the uh, percentage of the lottery uh, ticket winners during this period of time that were under 30 years old, you would say two out of 30, two divided by 30. Similarly, if I asked you, if you randomly pick one lottery uh, 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 winner from these 30 people, what's the probability that they would be under 30? And that's, of course, the same thing, two out of 30, whatever that whatever that comes out to be, it's a little less than 10%, right? About 8% or so, right? Or 0.08 if we uh, describe it as a proportion, okay? So the only other twist on this is that occasionally you might apply a condition to your random sample or your probability. For instance, I might ask you, what's the probability that someone is, uh, that a lottery winner is under 30 given that you know that they're under 40, right? In other words, that's a conditional probability. Given that the, the only people that, that you're gonna examine, given that they're under 40, what's the probability that they're also under 30, right? And we have five, uh, we have a total of seven people under 40, only two of them are under 30, so that would be two over seven, right? That's a typical conditional probability. We're going to be before even this one hour session, we're going to have, uh, and very much so in the lecture and in the recorded uh, other exercises that you see on Blackboard, you're going to see that there are uh, uh, important applications for this as we progress here. So that's pretty simple, right? So you shouldn't have too much trouble with that. And I'm sorry I even mentioned probability in there because it kind of threw a few people off because they had noticed from a previous session that I had a few grayed out folders because I knew I wasn't going to get to them uh, during that session. Uh, and they were called probability or something like that. So but you should be able to get through that. The other thing is about the homeworks, as always, as long as you do the homework, uh, uh, as long as you can submit the homework at least once before the deadline, you get to go back to it anytime you want. So for instance, I even have, I think I might've posted an early uh, 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 assignment three. You know, uh, I, I don't know if I divided up in A and B, I don't remember right now. I may have posted assignment, I, I posted assignment three, and that covers material we're doing today. Maybe we won't finish it all today and so on and so forth, but there's no penalty for going in there and just giving it a try. So even as you play a recording, if you're curious about, you know, uh, uh, what does this look like if I, uh, uh, when I see it in homework, you can just, uh, just open the homework up and, uh, and look at it, give it a try. When you're ready, you can submit it. Just submit it before the deadline, right? Whenever it's, it's posted as due. Anytime in the rest of the semester, you can go back for a higher grade. In fact, most people will go and redo the homeworks preparing for the first exam, for instance. Why? Because maybe the exam has, uh, has, looks a lot like the homework. Right, certainly a, a good portion of it will, not all of it will, but a good portion. There'll be a few questions to uh, test your mettle a little bit, you know, and, and kind of like maybe, uh, uh, make you think a bit, but a lot of it is going to be very similar to the, uh, to the, to the assignments, right? It has to be, because that's what we're doing, that's what we're covering. Okay, so, so uh, now, so we have, we have that situation. I'm going to open up a uh, document that we have on here. That's called cross tabs. There's a similar one that I think it's almost the identical. Uh, it's called three cross tabs. It's under the exercises section uh, in Blackboard and and in this folder for the folder for this session. And um, it basically is a table. Sometimes you call these cross tabs, right? Because you got columns and rows. So another name for them frequently is contingency tables, right? Rows and columns. So in this case. We have from uh, the year of the flood, I'm sure this date is pretty old. We've been using it forever, right? We have a, um, a table 
that describes the number of the status, marital status of all the people in the United States, right? Now these numbers are in millions. So 29.7 is 29.7 millions, but we're not, we don't have to be worried about that because we're really looking at uh, probabilities and proportions here. So we don't care if it's millions or dozens or whatever, right? So, and we have it broken up into, into two rows, male and female, and we have it broken up into a number of columns, single, married, widowed, and divorced, right? So from this table, we can do the same thing we just did with that histogram to determine if we take a random sample. Again, I'm gonna emphasize that because a lot of times you're gonna be doing that because we need to understand the population without actually measuring the entire population. So we need to take samples and, and in order to make sure that we get a good picture of the population, they're gonna be or often gonna be random samples. Uh, in the lecture, you, you, you uh, may be seeing some mention of other kinds of sampling, stratified and so on and so forth. But basically the objective is to get as, as good a picture of the population as possible. Okay, so if we take a random sample from this population, one person just randomly sampled, I don't know, based on social security numbers, based on phone numbers, whatever, we take a random sample from one person, what's the probability that this person is divorced? First of all, what's the total population here? It's 214, of course, that we're talking people that are over 21, I guess, 18 or 21. And uh, that, that population at the, during this period happened to be 214.2 million. So what's the probability that person is divorced? Well, how many people are divorced in this population? 21.7, right? So what's the probability that they're divorced? Well, if we randomly sample one person, the probability we select that person in a divorce is 21.7 over 214.2. If anybody has a calculator and they do that and want to yell out the answer, you can. I'm not gonna, I, I guess I might as well pull up my calculator just for the hell of it. Okay, 21.7 divided by 214.2 is equal to about 10%, 0 0.10, probability of 0 0.10, or about 10% of the population at that time was divorced. So what's the probability that a person is male? Well, how many people are male in this population? 104.9 out of the 214.2. Okay, so it's just a simple interpretation. So the probability we randomly select someone that's male is 104 over 214, whatever that comes out to be, be 45% or something like that, or 0.45 as a probability. Is it more likely we would select a male or a female? more likely we would select a female because there's more of them in the population, right? So where males would be, probability of selecting a male might be 47%, probability of selecting a female might be 53%, 109 over 214. Everybody's comfortable with that, right? No strange stuff there. Now, I'm going to introduce the idea of a conditional probability. And you're going to say, well, who cares about conditional probabilities? It's going to come up later on. What's a given that a person is male, What's the probability that he's married? Okay, so what's the total population we're dealing with now? Given that a person is male, in other words, only we're only considering the males. So we're not gonna divide by 214, we're gonna divide by 104.9, because that's the number of males. So what's the probability that that, that, that male is married? Well, 63.5 uh, million out of 104.9 million males are married, so in other words, it's going to be 60, what was it, 63.5? Five divided by 104.9, and that comes out to be about 61%, 0.605. Okay, no big deal here, right? Pretty straightforward. So, I'm gonna move on from there for a moment. And I'm gonna say, let's, let's, let's start working with a, 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 something a little bit different. Okay, so how about situation where we have some condition in the population, diabetes, diabetes uh, 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 whether a person is vaccinated or not, uh, whether a person is insured and so on and so forth, and we're interested in understanding 
uh, uh, how, how that what the probability is that we would find the proportion of probability we would find people in this population that meet the criteria that we're interested in. Okay, so I'm going to start off. The probability that a person is insured in the United States is about 80 percent. I don't know what it really is, you know, right now with Obamacare and Obamacare, you know, doesn't have funding now and it's they don't advertise. So it, it moves around. If it used to be about 78 percent, they've got up to about 86 percent. Now it's back. It might be back down 80 percent. 80 percent is nice round numbers. I'm going to use that. Okay, don't go around telling people that uh, the rate of insurance in the United States is 80%. But I don't know what it is right now. I could probably look it up, right? Okay, so you choose one person randomly from the population, completely randomly. What's the probability that that person is going to be insured? 80%, right? You pick one random person from the population. What's the probability that, that person is not insured? That's not a rhetorical question. I'm looking for an answer. 20%, makes sense, right? Okay, that's assuming it's dichotomous. You don't have it, you have only those two possibilities, insured or not insured. That's probably true, right? Because that's the kind of thing that you either are or you aren't, right? Okay, so 20%. Okay, let's say you choose three people randomly from the population. What's the probability that all three of those people that you insured are, uh, that you picked are insured? What do you think that might be? Let me back up one step. If I flip a coin, it's probably get heads. One half, right? If I flip a second coin, what's the probability I'll get heads or tails after flipping that first coin? Coin doesn't know what the previous coin was, right? Or previous thoughts was. It's 50 50 again, one half. What's the probability or 50%? What's the probability if I put third coin? Still gonna be 50%. So if I instead flip three coins or flip the same coin three times without stopping, what's the probability all three results will be heads? Everyone has it to guess, right? You guys have, you guys have like, you know, done this on, you know, in the schoolyard, right? Gambled a little in the schoolyard, been to Vegas, you know, maybe Atlantic City or something like that. If it's 50 50, well, it's one half, it's 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5 times 0. 0.5. Okay. So you can look at it this way. Okay. On the first coin flip, the probability you might get heads it is one out of two. You're going to get a heads or a tails, right? So now let's say you get a heads, right? The, the second coin you flip could be a head or a tail, right? So the first one possibility is you could get two heads. Second possibility is you could get two a uh, head and a tail. The, uh, if you would flip tails first, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the next coin could be a heads or it could be a tails, which would be a tails and heads or two tails. So there's only one out of four possib possible outcomes that gives you two heads, one out of four, 25%. Another way of looking at that is 50% chance times 50% chance is 0 0.25. 0 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25 or 25% or one in four. And again, what's the probability of, of uh, getting uh, uh, three heads in a row? 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, which is one out of eight, which is 0 0.125. Okay, so the probability a person is insured is 80%. If I randomly select three people on the street and, you know, pe three people randomly in the country, okay, and ask them if they're insured, what's the probability all three would be insured? You don't have to give me a number, just what you would calculate it as. Ah, that's guy lets music to my ears. 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8. Everybody agree with that? Right? What's the probability you randomly select three people? and none of those three people are insured. 0. 0.2 times 0. 0.2 times 0. 0.2. Okay, what's the probability you randomly accept 10 people and all of them are insured? It's gonna be 0. 0.8 times 0. 0.8 times 0. 0.8, to the 10th power, right? 0. 0.8 times itself, 10 times. Okay? That's easy, that kind of calculation is easy. Well, what if we randomly select 10 people? What's the probability that Gee, what's the probability that six out of the 10 are insured? That gets very complicated now, doesn't it? Because the first person could be insured or uninsured. The second person could be insured. Could have the first five people all insured, and then the sixth person not, the seventh person maybe is. Or the, and you could have any combination of them. 
So once you take away the idea that all of them are, come out exactly the same, then things get a bit hairy, don't they? It, it gets complicated. You get a lot of possibilities there. Okay, and we're going to get into that. Okay, especially when we deal with dichotomous data, data that has uh, two possible outcomes: male, female, uh, diabetic, not diabetic. In this case, insured, not insured. Right. So we're we're going to wind up getting into that probably next week. We'll get into that in a lot of detail when we talk about the binomial two possibilities distribution and the standard normal distribution. Okay, which is for other kind of numerical variables. Okay, so we're going to get into that next week, but keep that in mind kind of in the back of your head a little bit. Okay, so um, let me move on from there. So just keep that, keep it, keep that in mind, this idea of probability and, uh, and this idea of conditional probability. You know, a, a certain condition is met, now it changes what the odds are and so on. So we're going to talk now about diagnostic tests. Everybody at one time or another is at a diagnostic test. I'm going to open up this document. I'm going to open this document, but I, you know, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I think I probably, I might, uh, the, you know, the homework might have something like that in it. But I'm going to, I'm going to kind of wing it here. And uh, I, I'm not sure if I do this in the homework or not, but I'm going to make up a disease and a diagnostic test for it. And I may have done, it may, maybe exactly, maybe kind of what we're doing now. In the homework, but different numbers, mostly because I probably can't remember the numbers in homework anyway. The memory issue. Okay, I have a disease called cooties. Okay, did I still have that when I was a kid? They, that was the thing. Yeah. So, so I got various feedback on whether people have ever heard of that before or not. So, so cooties, right? So you either have it or you don't have it, right? So the the prevalence of cooties in our population is a lot of it going around. So prevalence is 10%. So let's say 0 0.10. Okay, that's our prevalence. Okay, so now, a, uh, now, now cooties, uh, in order to diagnose cooties, you need a series of blood tests. You gotta take them every week or six weeks or something like that. They have to incubate it and, at 98.6 degrees and they have to then inject it into a, a, a chicken egg for another six weeks and so it's very expensive, difficult, and basic tests, right? So a researcher finds a screening test for cooties. He's invented a screening test for cooties. And he wants to determine how well this screening test works. Okay, so I'm going to take, I'm going to make up one of those cross tabs or contingency tables. And I'm going to take a, uh, I'm going to take a, uh, uh, let's see. So I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take a uh, you know I'm going to take a population of a thousand people, and I'm going to say to myself, out of those thousand people, how many people it, would we expect in our sample to have cooties out of a thousand people? Ten percent prevalence. We expect a hundred, right? Ten percent of a thousand is hundred. How many people would we not expect to have cooties? 900. Okay, so I'm going to say I'm going to make I'm going to call this column to the left people who have cooties disease plus, right? And column to the right disease minus people who don't have cooties, right? And then I'm going to I'm going to apply this test, the screening test, and then I'm going to convert I'm going to send send these people for a the gold standard test, which is very expensive, just to determine if they really had cooties. Okay, so when I get my data back, I'm going to split it up and I'm going to say, okay, who tested positive using the screening test and who tested negative? Okay, but now I know whether they have the disease or not. So as it turns out that, as it turns out that among the 100 people who had cooties, right, it turns out that 85 of them tested positive, 15 of them tested negative. Right. So let's define this now. A person has cooties and tests positive. What's a good name for that? That's a positive, right? But it's a true positive. Right. Well, how about a person who tests, uh, who has the disease but tests negative? What's that? That's a negative. What kind of negative do you think it is? It's a false negative. Makes sense, right? Tested negative, but they have the disease, the false negative. 
Now, how about the 900 people uh, that, that don't have uh, uh, that don't have hoodies? How does that turn out? Well, it turns out that uh, 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 90 of them test positive, and 810 of them test negative. So the 810 people who don't have cooties and test negative, those are true negatives. The 90 people who test po that test positive but don't actually have it, those are false positives. Okay. So if I add all this up, there's 170, 170, uh, 160, 75 people who test, who test positive, and there's 825 people who test negative. Okay. So what, what do you think of the quality of this test? Well, one of the ways we can look at how good a test, diagnostic test this is, is we can take a look at what's called the sensitivity Okay. And the sensitivity is how good it is at predicting a person actually has the disease. In other words, it's the number of people that, that have the disease that test positive over the total number of people that have the disease. So it's going to be 85 out of 100. Okay. So in other words, it is the true positives over the true positives plus the false negative. Okay, this, this down here is actually just all the people that actually have the disease. False negatives are people who have the disease but test negative. They can test positive or negative. So we're going to call that sensitivity. So this is 85%. Since they, it, it actually catches 85% of people actually have the disease. Well, what about, you know, we've got a problem here because sometimes it, it made people think they had the disease when they don't actually have it. Because they tested positive, even though they don't have it. Okay, well, let's take a look at that. Okay, we're going to call that the specificity. Okay, and the specificity is the number of people that test negative, the correct result, over the total number of people that, are, that actually are negative, 900. So how good is it at identifying those people as being uh, negative? It's 810 out of uh, 900. Is that 90%? That's 90%, right? I'm not, uh, I'm not having a senior moment. That is 90%, I think. 810 mm -hmm. divided by, I'm not getting any feedback here. I know you guys are younger and smarter than I am, so you should be able to figure that out. 90%, right. Okay, that's our specificity. Now, let's look at, let, let's look at another thing here. How many people tested positive? Total out of this population. 85, 90, they're both positive, right? How many people test that? What's the total number of people test positive? 175 people, right? And what are they? They're the true positives and the false positives. So out of 1,000 people, 175 people tested positive. Okay. Out of those 175 people, how many of them actually have cooties? 85 of them. Okay. So if I am one of those 175 people, I say to myself, well, that's very interesting, doctor, you did this diagnostic test and you're going to send me off for, you know, like treatment for whatever it is. I don't know. I think they rub your head with soap or something like that. I don't know what is the proper, what the progress of the disease or the prognosis is for cooties. But I'm going to send you for treatment or for the testing, right? More expensive testing, more invasive testing. So you say to yourself, okay, I, I tested positive. But you know, this test, no test is perfect, right? Now that I've tested positive, I really want to know what's the likelihood I actually have this disease that's going to impact whether or not I want to seek further treatment, get more invasive testing done, you know, go immediately into treatment or whatever, and so on and so forth. This is a, you know, a conundrum for any patient that gets a positive test, you know, no matter what kind of test it is, right? So what's the probability that if you test positive, you actually have the disease? Well, let's see. The number of people that tested positive is 175. The number of people that actually have the disease that tested positive 
is 85. So what is that? That's the true positives over all of the positives, which are the true positives plus the false positives. Okay. So 85 over 175. Let's calculate that out. When I say 85, 85 divided by 175 equals 0.48, about 49%. So the probability I actually have cooties is 48%. 48, well, was it closer to 48? Yeah, almost four eight six. So, so you know, that means about 50-50, and I actually have cooties. So, so that's interesting. So this was not a terrible test, right? 85% of the time it actually caught people that had the disease uh, without very without a lot, very cheaply, and with a lot of inv without invasive testing. And 90% uh, of the time it screened people out who don't have the disease, which is pretty good also. So what do you think? Pretty good test for this. Now, let's say we take this same test. This time, we're going to apply it to a population that with a prevalence of cooties of only 10%, of only, of only 1%. How many of you guys think it's going to have an impact on all this? We're going to get the same sensitivities. Well, it's going to be the same sensitivity specificity, right? Think it's going to impact on the positive predictive values? What do you guys think? Huh? Well, let's say we're going to give it a try, right? So let's give it a let's let's actually give it a try. I'm going to close this. Okay, so let's give this a try. Okay, so same thing here. Okay, so population, you're not going to make the population 10,000. Somebody, I think, suggested that maybe. Ten, only because I want to keep the numbers right. I could have made, I could make it 1,000, but I'm going to keep the numbers right. What did I say the prevalence in this population was? Prevalence was 0.01, not 10%, but 1%. So out of 10,000 people, how many of those people are going to have cooties? Well, this time it's 100 also, right? Because 1% of 100 uh, it would have been 10 if I only used 1,000. But the number, it's going to work out the same, it's all proportion. How many people in this population don't have cooties? Well, that's 9,900 people don't have cooties. Okay, so let's figure out what this is going to be. Now, this is people who have the disease and people who don't have the disease. So out of those 100 people who don't have the, that out of 100 people who actually have cooties that have the disease, how many of those 100 test positive in this scenario? Okay, well, remember, what's the sensitivity of this test? You haven't changed the test, right? Just change the people that we're applying it to. The sensitivity is 85%. And what was the specificity? It was 90%. Staying the same. Only thing's changing is the prevalence. It's a different population. Same test, different population. It's still just as good. At screening people. So out of 100 people, 85% is 85 people, 15 people. It went about the specificity. Now, specificity is, let's see, 10% of this, 990 people test positive for the disease, even though they don't have it. So it's 90% of them, which is 990 minus 9,900, which is 8,910, I think. Somebody check my math. I think I'm right. That's zero, zero, 18 carried one. Yes, that's right. Okay. That's because 90% 90 of the time we'll get it right, but 10% of the time uh, uh, we'll, we'll tell people that don't have the, that have, don't have disease that they tested positive. Okay, so what's the total number of people that tested positive this time? The total number of people tested positive is uh, 1,075. What's the total number of people that tested negative? 
Okay, well, that's, uh, let's see, uh, 8,925. Everybody comfortable with that? So, if you tested positive for acuities in this population, same test the other guys got. If you tested positive in this situation, the cooties, what's the likely you actually had the disease? Let's think about this. How many people tested positive actually have the disease? 85. How many people that tested positive, how, out of the total number of people that tested positive, which is 1,075, okay? So the probability you actually have the disease, given that you've tested positive, is going to be quite a bit different, right? So it's going to be, going to be 85 divided by 1075 is equal to, whoa, about 8%, 0 0.079. Point oh seven 0.079. So the probability that you actually have this disease is only 8%. This point, even though it's a fairly good test, 85% uh, sensitivity, 90% specificity, you know, it's a pretty good test. The, the fact that the prevalence is so low, it turns out that the positive predictive value goes down, even though you haven't changed the test at all. So the prevalence is one of the most important factors in whether or not when you get a positive diagnosis on the test, whether or not it really is accurate, whether it really is predicting you have the disease. What's a good name for this number down here? The likelihood you that you um, uh, have the disease if you test positive. Anyone want to come up with a number for me? Well, what's a good name for that? Well, it, what you're trying to do is predict whether or not a person is positive or not. How about positive predictive value or PPV? Positive predictive value. I don't know if you can read that very well, but positive predictive value. Okay. So the positive predictive value for this test when applied to a population of 1% is only about 8%. When it was applied to a population uh, uh, with a prevalence of 10%, it was 50%. Okay. Much more, much more uh, uh, reliable test for someone that, that uh, got a positive result in terms of predicting whether they actually had the disease. That's important. Now, the other thing is, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going to repeat what I call this positive predictive value. That's the probability that you have the disease given that you've tested positive, right? People have tested positive over the total number of people. Yeah, the number of people who have the disease over the total number of people that tested positive. The, Probability that you have the disease given that you have tested positive. What kind of probability is that? Help me out here. What kind of probability is that? That's called a conditional probability. Okay, just like we had before, given that, you are, that the person's male, what's the probability that they're married? In this case, given that they tested positive. Given that they tested positive, what's the probability actually happens? Out of the total number of people that tested positive, how many of them actually have the disease? Okay. Conditional probability. So now that I told you about positive predictive value, what about these people down here that tested negative? What do you think we might call another number that we're going to use to predict how good a predictor that is that they actually don't have the disease? If we call this positive predictive value, what do we call that? Negative, bingo, great, negative predictive value. And how do we calculate negative predictive value here? Again, it's the number of people that don't have, that tested negative, that don't have the disease, 89, 10, mm -hmm. divided by mm -hmm. the total number of people that tested negative. Right, only 15 people uh, that uh, uh, have the disease that tested negative. So it's over 89, 25. 89.10 over 89.25, and the negative predictive value is, here, here. 
and that's 89 okay. divided by 89 is equal to wow almost nine 99.8 or 99.8% of the time, you would not have to see. Anything change in the test? It's exactly the same test. But look at the impact that it had. Anybody, can anybody think of a, a diagnostic test that's very widely applied to a population that is very, a rel, a, a very low, you know, I'm going to say relatively low prevalence because if you have these diseases, it don't seem like a low prevalence to you. You have it. Right, but I mean, in, in reality, at any given moment, what the prevalence of the, of the disease is in the population. They may think of a, a, a test like that. They're always controversial because there's so many false positives and so on and so forth. And it's, right. it's really the fact that it's, a, it's very widely applied and, um, uh, and the actual rate of disease is very low prevalent. Anybody think of it? How about for females, uh, uh, breast screenings? Mammograms. How about uh, uh, Pap smears? Right. Okay. Check out what the what the specificity and sensitivity. You can actually Google that, right? Google out what the specificity and and, and uh, uh, sensitivity is, and what the positive predictive value is for those. How about for males? What 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 tests they screen almost everybody for? All males for and about, starting about fifty or something. Like that. What's that? Prostate PSA. Right. Protein specific antigen, right? And again, there's a test that they started to recommend for, for men, all men when they were 40, when they passed 40. Problem, problem is, is that the threshold that they set for uh, a more invasive testing, for the further testing, is relatively low. And it's, you know, at 40, the prevalence of the disease in the population is, in males is very low. If you get to 50, it gets higher. As you get to 60, it gets higher. As you get to 80, it's ridiculous, right? But in that low prevalence, you know, now they don't, I don't think they, you know, I think they're more conservative about screening. Unless you have a history, they probably don't start screening until 50. Right? Unless you have a family history or some other, or it's symptoms or something like that. Right? So, yeah, so a lot of tests like that, that you would say to yourself, why, why don't we just apply this test to the entire population? And, and, uh, and uh, wind up uh, seeing, you know, like, and screening everybody. Well, that's, that's the problem. You should start screening everybody, and you're gonna get, you, know, you wind up gonna get getting a lot of false positives. And uh, chasing a lot of uh, uh, bad leads. So, so negative predictive value, positive predictive value. So now, there is a, um, let's see, I, I have it here. New picture. Let's see. I don't know if I have it. Let's see what I got. Yeah. Oh, that's the device. Okay, I'm gonna have to blow this up so you can actually read it. I can. Ah. See, now Excel is a, a compliant program. It does what you want it to do. Okay. Now, first, let me get a formula. I, rather than try and write this out, just go on the internet and just. Base formula. And get an image. Okay, I'll use this one. This is a good one. Okay, let's take a look at this. This is Bayes' rule or Bayes' theorem. It says that, and I'm not going to go into too much detail here, at least not now. Okay, when we have more time, I'll, I'll, I'll have more time with you. I will go into more detail on it. In the, in the lecture, the recorded lecture that's here, I think that Levi goes into it a bit. 
And I may also go into it a bit more in the, in the recorded uh, exercises that are at the end of that section. Okay, what, is that, what does this theorem tell us? It tells us that the probability of A given B has occurred, right? Uh, where have we seen this? Probability that you have uh, that you have the disease given you've tested positive, right? A is the probability you have the disease. B is the probability you tested positive, right? So, so given that the given that condition B has occurred, what's the prob and uh, what's the probability that A is occurring? Well, sometimes it's a little problematic figuring that out. So this can be broken down into the oops. How'd that happen? The probability, ah, you know what it is, I'm, I'm trying to hover over it, using my mouse to hover over it, and uh, it's it's taking me right to the, uh, here we go. I'll try not to click on it. Okay, the probability that uh, 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 B occurs given A, in other words, in our case, what's the probability that you test positive given you have the disease? A is the probability you have the disease, right? Probably you have the disease given you test positive. The probability you have the disease given you test positive. And, uh, okay, so, uh, excuse me, probability you test positive given you have the disease. Do we know that? What's the probability that you test positive given you have the disease? Don't we have a name for that? Probability you test positive given that you have the disease. That's the sensitivity. We know that what that is, right? So. What is the probability you have the disease? Probability A, probability you have the disease. We know that also. What's that called? That's called the prevalence, right? And what about down here? Probability that you have the disease. Uh, uh, <laughs> the probability that you test positive, right? Well, what is that? That's the probability of false positives plus the probability of true positives, right? All the positives. Probability you test positive is Two groups, people that tested positive that had disease, people that tested positive that didn't have disease. So I can use this formula, rather than kind of like make up this fake population, I can use this formula to determine the positive predictive value. But you look at this formula, you say, oh man, Tony, you've got to remember which A is and which B is, and all this kind of stuff. Isn't there a simpler way to lay this out so that I don't have to remember all this? Well, let's take a look. We have here. Let's take a look at what we have here. So the top was, let's see, positive predictive value, the probability you have the disease given that you test positive, is uh, the sensitivity times the prevalence. What does that mean, sensitivity? The prevalence, if we're 10%, right? The sensitivity, if we were 90%, 99% 90, 90 of the time it gets it right, that would be the proportion of the population that has the disease and tests positive. Right, that's our top part. Well, what's this down here? This is the pro probability you have the, the same thing you got at the top. It's the probability you have the disease and you test positive again. That top is true positive, proportion of the population that's a true positive. And this is the proportion of the population that's a true positive on the bottom, plus the proportion of the population that's a false positive. We got to add the positive together to the bottom. Right, what is that? Well, let's see. First, number one, it's one minus the prevalence is the proportion of the population that doesn't have the disease. In other words, it's present with 10%, this would be 90% of the population doesn't have the disease, times one minus the specificity. Specificity is how good, what percentage of people uh, 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 that don't have the disease test negative, which is correct, one minus specificity times, uh, times the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, number of people that don't have the disease. That's the, that's the number, of, that's a proportion of false positives. False. So what do we have here in reality? We have the tr proportion of true positives over the proportion of true positives plus the proportion of uh, false positives. Pos uh, po uh, this is the total positives and this is the just the true positive. In other words, a positive predictive value. Let's try it for our, for our problem that we just had here, okay? So I'm going to go, I'm going to say the sensitivity. Can I click in here? Why is it not let me click in here? Oh, I have to, do I have to do something here? I got to make that go away. Okay. 
So, oh yeah, now I can click in. Or maybe I can't click in. Oh, I know these are all frozen. Let's see if I can get in here. Oh, here we go. Okay. So I want to step through this in reality. Thank you guys. Okay, so what's the top part for, take our first population. First population was 10%, right? Prevalent. I'll, I'll write it down here. First population, the prevalence was 10%, 0 0.01. I'm sorry, 0 0.10. Our sensitivity was, what was it again, 0.85? 85%. And our specificity was 90%, 0.90. Okay, so let's figure this out. The top part of this is going to be equal to our sensitivity, 0.85, times our prevalence, which is 0.1. The bottom part I'm going to split up into two parts. The first part is 1 minus, the, uh, excuse me, the first part is the same thing as the I got to go up here to positive. To ignore this bottom part. That's negative. Uh, the top part, the sensitivity on this In other words, the same thing as this 0.85. I'm just going to say equals this. So that's the total number. That's the proportion of true positives. 8.5 percent of the population tests positive and actually have disease. So let's go down here and look at this second part, which is equal to. Let's see what we got here. It is one minus the specificity. I'm going to put that in here, 1 minus the specificity, which is this. That's actually going to be it's a, a 1 minus 0.9. It's going to be 0.1. We know that, right? Times 1, I'll put this in place. It's also 1 minus the prevalence, which is 0.1. That's going to be 0.9. Okay, and I'm going to hit enter. And that adds up to that. So now I'm going to finish this off. And I'm going to say to myself, okay, let's put this together. The part on the top is 0.85. And the part on the bottom is this. I'm going to put my two in This. Oops. Plus this. Trope the true positives and the false positives. Hit enter. And it's 0.884485. Remember? That's about the 49% that we got before. So we get the same answer with this as we did with that. That cross that we got before. Everybody comfortable with that? Okay. And, and just to just to give you an idea, now what if what if I said to myself, what if the population, the prevalence in the population, the specificity, sensitivity said the same, but now the prevalence is going to be one percent instead. Okay, let's see what happens to our positive predictive value. And there there's our eight and one down to eight percent. So that's one of the nice things about Excel, right? You can do this what if kind of thing. What if I change this and you automatically readjust all the calculations? Okay. So just to give us an idea of what's going on here, I just want to go peek in at the home B page. Okay. So I put these up. You got quite a while to get to them. I did I put a date on them. I didn't even bother putting a date, a due date on them yet, right? So probably, it, will, it will be after the 24th. So you know, they're plenty far away. Uh, so, I don't, do I have anything here? Oh, oh, 2A. Let's see. Yeah, that's the one. Number two. So we're, where are we now? Let's take a look. Prevalence of diabetes is 10%. You test three randomly select the person's population. What is the probability of all three are diabetic? Kind of sounds like what we just did. Uh, you know, there's some stuff on Venn diagrams. You'll see it in the lecture. And next session, I will, re if you guys are uncomfortable with what you see in the lecture, record a lecture on Venn diagrams, I'll go over them again, okay, so that we, we understand them. Don't worry about it too much. You'll probably figure this stuff out. So, you know, in the Venn diagram, what we're describing here is, say there's two populations, like A and B population. Maybe A, people who have cancer, B, people who have heart disease, right? So uh, uh, in this Venn diagram, the portion of this diagram that represents people who have heart disease is B, right? which is B, B. In this one, represents the proportion of people who have cancer or heart disease, right? So that's everybody, right? So. 
So, so A, and that's called a union. A union B, that, that U, means that includes, it's an or, it includes either one, either possibility is, uh, is it within our criteria. Okay, well, what about, you want to know if people have cancer and heart disease, right? Well, that's called intersection. In other words, only people that have both would be included in that group or in that uh, slice of our Venn diagram. And if you look here, that's A, intersection B. Intersection is usually indicated by an upside down U. I use the word there because it's just easier to do. Okay, well, how about this one over here? A, uh, what does this represent? Well, it represents A, but it excludes people, which is people who have cancer, but excludes people who have heart disease. So in other words, that would be A, we'd start with A, but then we would want to exclude people who have heart disease. So it would be only people that are A, but they're also not B. In other words, intersection means they, they meet both criteria. So A, intersection, not B. I'm sorry I'm recording this, Jeff. I, you know, I, I want you to go back on it naively, not play it, and do this on your own. Okay, and the rest of this is like the same thing about cooties and stuff like that. I, I used cooties. It's a different, fortunately, a different specificity, so you have to do the problem on your own. Okay, I, I didn't realize I used cooties. In that too. Okay, so I don't think you have too much of a problem with that. Okay, and then, let, and then there's another, uh, the, the second part of this homework, which is 2B. Again, you know, you have until September 24th. But that doesn't mean don't do it until September 24th, right? That means you have until then. But it, I would prefer you do it when your mind is fresh. In other words, what's a better time to do that homework than tonight after you've just heard this, right? And then do it again before the exam or uh, before it's due and so on and so forth. And this, again, this, this one only, what this one asks you to do is kind of like what we did with our... Uh, contingency table, except it, it puts you in the position of actually looking into real data, real sources of data, and putting it together on your own. Like for instance, this tells you, if you click on this, you can download the uh, 2013 mor mor uh, Morbidity and Mortality Report for New York City from the uh, Department of Health website. I'm gonna click on that. So, the you know, person died, divide, died in New York City in 2013, what's probability the cause of death was poisoning or whatever. Right. So take a look at this document. Look at this. It actually has all this information in it, info mortality, mortality from made you know, from different uh, uh, situations and so on. So here, take a look at the picture here. This shows us the death rate in New York City over the last. Oops. I got to get it small again so I can get it back into the picture again. Oh, yeah. Ah, too small. Okay. Yeah, it, uh, you know, it, it's great that I can do this, but I'm having trouble controlling it. With great power comes great responsibility. Where's that from? Do you know that? Yeah? Spider-Man. Close, you were close. Okay, so th take a look at this. We have data going back to 1860s, uh, to 1800s on mortality rates in New York City. Pretty good data. And look, as there were different uh, different outbreaks of disease, look how high the mortality rate got during those different periods. Right? Notice how it's gradually, continually going down, right? And, and uh, dramatically going down. And there's a bump right here. There's the actual bump where you can see a difference in the mortality rate from the World Trade Center uh, in 2001. And so, and that's highlighted there, so you can highlight where that came from. So this gives you an idea of what the, the overall mentality was. Like I said, sometimes you have too much power. But if you go through this, you'll find that there are tables in here that give you a lot more detail on the mortality from different causes in, in New York City. And I think I'm going to get to this. Here we go, in the second part of it here. Life expectancy, where are my tables? Got, here we go. Leading causes of death in New York City. So if I asked you, uh, uh, what's the probability that, that uh, New York City, that a person died from an assault, 
homicide, right? Um, um, uh, if I asked you, what's probably they died from an assault or homicide, uh, if they were between 24 and 34 years old, you just look across here and the number was 99 out of uh, uh, the total number of uh, po total population of New York. I think they have it, they have it in here somewhere. But look through this document and see if you can't, if you can't, look, all male and female and so on and so forth, they have, they have the, the number of deaths and by, uh, de by percentage of deaths, not by percent of population, but by percentage of deaths. And I think you should have, I think you have the population data in here also. If you don't, if it's not in here and somewhere else, you can look up the population data for 2013 in New York City, also from the Department of Health. I think it's in there somewhere. But at any rate, play around with this document. Uh, uh, give the homework a try. Okay? And this one's just asking you to do the same thing we did before with kind of like estimating probabilities. Uh, 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 ran, if you randomly select someone from this population, what's the probability that this would occur? And so on. Okay, by the way, this is the this is one of the documents that the, uh, that the uh, age adjustment data came from that we were playing around with. Uh, I think last week or the week before. Okay. So give it a try. Any questions? Is comfortable with this? Is it scary? Is it okay? I didn't do anything scary today, right? I'm sure I did. Okay. Give it a try. Uh, we'll be back here next Monday. Same time, same place. Uh, you have the videos, you have the videos to watch and so on and so forth. And I, I really recommend, especially the lecture video. You should watch that one because it's a different person, you get a different perspective on it. A lot more detail in the background the theory as well. Right? And even though it could be a little boring and maybe he isn't really the thing's gonna be much prominent on the exam, exact exam, it's still something that you should see and uh, uh, will help you kind of help you kind of round out your understanding of it.